I'm Stefan Mafu. Um, Assalamualaikum to people that are here from Moss. Um, I am a family doctor and I went to uh, volunteer in a Greek refugee camp on the island of Lesbos. This, uh, my presentation is basically going to be a lot of pictures that I took with my cell phone. I am not a professional photographer, and, um, but my pictures are really great. Uh, but if you are a professional photographer, you might not like them. But that's okay. Um, so I just want to kind of just point out something on this uh, uh, this paper, which is that um, this is half of the camp. This is actually a former Greek detention facility, and if you see, there's a lot of barbed wire here. And um, that was the first thing I saw when I got there. And it kind of just set a tone for me that I was kind of uncomfortable with because these people are not detained, and there's no reason for them to feel that they need to be in a detention center. But um, this is what the Greek government donated uh, to this cause. And I understand that it's a big building with lots of rooms, and some of them are heated, some of them aren't, and they have bathrooms practical. But um, the, the, the uh, mixing together, in my opinion, of refugees uh, with people that uh, were uh, uh, that are guilty of something and have to be, uh, even I don't necessarily agree with how prisons are, but um, the barbed wire and the, 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 symbol, the symbolism of, of what that actually represents in terms of violence, um, I, I, I thought that was kind of warped and twisted. But um, anyways, how this presentation is going to go is first we're going to do maps, then we're going to talk a little bit about what happens. I'm going to talk a little bit about medic work, and then I'm just going to show you some pictures and videos of relief work. So we're going to try and go fast because I only have 15 minutes. But if you don't understand me or I'm, I'm talking too fast, please let me know because uh, sometimes I get ahead of myself. So, maps. <gasps> no, that's not going to Okay, cool. So, this is a map of. This is where I went. This is a little island called Lesbos. And, um, uh, it's really close to Turkey. In fact, the closest distance is 10 kilometers from Turkey. So the refugees were coming from various places. Uh, about 50% of them were coming from Syria. The rest were coming from places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, um, Morocco, and Algeria, uh, uh, particularly. There, I did see some Tamil people from India, but that was just about four. Uh, everyone else was from the countries that I just listed. Anyway, so they come across Turkey, and they get to about here. They also arrived to the island called Eos, which is right here, but I didn't get to go there. So this is the closest distance here, and there's a camp here called Scala. There's also a camp here, which is the main camp called Moria, which is where we were at. And the thing is, these people are arriving um, by a boat, and I'm going to get into that in a second. But these boats are actually driven, or whatever the word is for how boats are trans or move in the water, uh, uh, by the refugees who don't have a clue about what they're doing. And um, it's not funny at all, but it's, at first when you hear it, it's so absurd. You're like, so they push you in a boat, they rob you, and then they say, okay, now drive. And you're like, okay, uh, that's Greece, <coughs> so that's Europe, and so you just go towards that. But there's no navigation, uh, it's very haphazard, and these people are getting robbed. The cost of a ticket for one of these guys in one of these little dinghies is between 300 to 1,000 euros. The ferry from Turkey, if you come legally, is about 50 to 80 euros. So they're getting robbed. And on top of it, when they're getting in the boats, their stuff is getting dumped in the water because they're trying to stuff as many humans into the boats as possible. So they have to get rid of all their extra stuff. So a lot of these people are arriving to Europe penniless, broke, um, at, at, with nothing except for the numerous layers of clothes that, that they have on, uh, on their bodies. Um, this is the, the way that they're taking to get to Germany. So they get to Greece, so here's Lesbos. Oh no, wait, Lesbos isn't there, but anyway, there's Lesbos, is, Lesbos is right here with this red thing. And so they fly to Athens, or they take the ferry to Athens. Generally, the Syrian refugees that are arriving have a little bit more money because they've planned to leave. So a lot of them have Western Union themselves um, money that they can get when they uh, arrive to Lesbos, but what's ending up happening is that a lot of them are getting robbed and they don't have money. But So the camp that I was at is a transit camp, but we'll talk about that in a second, but I just want to talk about the route really quick, which is that they either fly or they take a ferry to Athens, and then from there they're going to Macedonia. Now at the Macedonian border when I had left, there was only a few ethnicities which were allowed to cross to the Macedonian border, that's Iraqis, Syrians, and Afghanis. So Iranians, Pakistanis, Algerians, Moroccans, everyone else can't go through, so people are lying about their ethnicities there. 
and that's another problem. Uh, some people are trying to go through Bulgaria, but um, allegedly it's very hostile there to refugees, and some people are trying to go through Albania, same thing. Macedonia is hostile to everyone except for the people that I said. And then the rest of their uh, trail goes through Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, and then this is Germany. Oh, no, that's Austria, and then there's Germany. So it's like Slovenia, then Austria, and then Germany. So a lot of people are trying to get to Germany. Some people are going to Sweden and other places. Um, moving on. Okay, so what happens? So, even though I'm a medic, I was involved in all sorts of stuff because I went with an alliance called Zambia Alliance for Refugees, and one of the things that they wanted was that they're trying to incorporate like a spiritual, social um, experience for all the volunteers, in addition to whatever special skill that they happen to have. So some people are translators, some people are medics, some people are just general volunteers that are really good at stuff like organizing, finding vulnerable families, reuniting families. Stuff like that. So um, because of that, I was able to do lots of different things. And one of the things that we were involved with is boat rescues. So okay, well, so this is a dinghy. It's about 25 feet long, and there's about 50 people in here. Generally, when these people are arriving, the guys are all on the outside of the dinghy, and the girls and the babies are in the middle, right? So I found that very sweet. But the problem with that is that these guys are arriving soaking wet, and it's about zero degrees there. Right now, maybe plus five max is pretty cold. And um, it's, you know, it's right by the water. There's usually a bit of a cool breeze. I thought I was, I'm like, oh, I'm going to Greece. I'm so excited. It's going to be such good weather. No, it's not good weather. It's very cold. And uh, these people are arriving soaking wet. Lots of hypothermia when they're arriving on the shores. Lots of babies that are severely dehydrated or at least mildly dehydrated. Lots of people that are um, uh, insulin uh, dependent diabetics that have out of control diabetes. Uh, people that are coming in shock, motion sickness, vomiting all over the place. Um, I mean, and that's just the initial assessment. So when they come, um, I mean, I can't tell you how many times, is there a doctor here? I'm running here. Is there a doctor here? I'm running there. I'm like, oh my god, I need to train somebody. I wish I had a resident. Um, these are, this is another inflatable boat that some people are uh, bringing over. About 30 people are arriving in something like this. I want to say, if you see this dinghy, right? The water, when I saw this dinghy arriving, was about up to here because the boat was so deep in the water because there's so many people. These are some life jackets. Some of these people do have actual real life jackets, but a lot of these life jackets are phony, fake, dupe, uh, meaning that they're filled with either uh, like junk or uh, I saw just one small piece of styrofoam come out of the back where the front had nothing in it. I met an Afghani guy that told me that the only reason he survived because he fell out of the boat is one because of the Spanish lifeguard that saved him, but the other reason is because he happened to have a water bottle that was empty in his hand and he used it to help <laughs> to help buoy him up. Like, I mean, it was like unbelievable. That's very creative, but at the same time, I'm like, that's really close for comfort. Like, I don't like the idea that you're being rescued by a water bottle. I mean, what if you didn't have one? And um, these are the Spanish lifeguards, super cool people. They're all volunteers. They're not part of an organization. Um, these people, what they're basically doing is they have a whole bunch of volunteers that are up on the cliffs on the island and they have Swedish military grade tele, uh, telescopes and binoculars that are looking for the boats coming across the water. What ends up happening is that then those volunteers, and again, no, none of these people are affiliated with an organization, they're basically just volunteers that just decided to go to help. Like people that are just like, I can't sit in my house and watch this happening, I have to be there. And I love them. Anyways, these people are sending uh, GPS coordinates then to the lifeguards, and then when you're at a boat rescue and you see these amazingly cool lifeguards in their skinny suits, um, or whatever, the wetsuits, uh, jumping into a hatchback and driving off somewhere really fast, you're like, I can't follow them. So everyone gets in the cars, they follow them, and they get to the next place wherever the boat's going to land, where they think the boat's going to land. So then these lifeguards swim out into the water and help pull the boats in. What ends up happening is a lot of times people are so afraid that they're jumping out of the boats into the freezing cold water, not thinking, um, can't really blame them, but then the problem is that they're soaking wet on the shore, and there's a couple of hours before they're going to get to any camp where we can get them dry clothes, so a lot of them are getting hypothermic. Um, anyways, so these are some of the Spanish life friends. I actually saw these guys on an airplane, so I was like, hey, can I take a picture of you? They were very gracious, and they let me. Um, this is them making a rescue. This, this, he's on a jet ski here. This boat was in distress. Now, the Greek Coast Guard cannot rescue uh, boats unless they're in distress. So uh, even if they don't know what they're doing, or they're making loops, or they run out of gas, which happens a lot of the time in the middle of the Aegean, 
nobody can help them, except for these Spanish lifeguards, who, in my opinion, are amazing. Um, while I was there, one boat sank. So I was there for two weeks, and within that two weeks, one boat sank and 14 people died. I was, dis I was, in s it was horrible. One child there lost both of her parents. She was a seven-year-old Syrian girl. Now she is gonna be in the Greek uh, adoption system. <sighs> like, you know, my God, you know? Like, uh, these tragedies are, like, every day something's happening. It's like, every day, it's just, it's just crazy. I can't imagine leaving Turkey with the hope that you're getting to Europe and then your parents die. It's unbelievable. This baby is super cute. I love him. Um, he came off the boat and he was actually doing pretty good, but he was so loud and he just had such a beautiful presence and spirit. And I took him and I like hugged him and I kissed him and I loved him. And then his sister had a messed up toenail that I fixed. And then I'm going to talk about him in a second when I get to another slide, but these people are Kurdish, and um, his father was killed by Daesh, uh, by ISIS, so his mother is a widow, and his, um, this baby's brother was killed by ISIS, so the mother, sister, and him came over. Um, and that's particularly why they came over. So uh, this was a particularly sad story, and it only, we only ended up finding out these stories is because you pile these soaking wet people into a car and you jack the heat up so that they can warm up a bit, and then you ask them their story. You're like, so what's your deal? Tell me about yourself. And so the, the mother told us. Um, luckily, we had a Kurdish translator. Those, are, those people are really hard to come by. OK, next. Here's, um, so you go from the boats and you get to the camps. How do you get from boat to camp? Well, the UNHCR provides buses. So one of the volunteers will call one of the people at UNHCR. UNHCR will send a bus, pile everyone into a bus, and then they get to one of the camps. There's numerous camps on the island, depending on where you land. and. Um, so this is Moria, the main registration camp that everyone's talking about. This is Karatepe. This is a camp for uh, Syrian women and children. Um, uh, this is Oxy, and this is Scala. This is the closest distance. So a lot of people are arriving to Oxy and Scala. But the thing is that um, uh, what's ended up happening is because the Turkish government is closing uh, or, or not allowing people to leave, even though I think they secretly are turning a blind eye to it, a lot of people are not arriving to uh, Scala and Oxy. In fact, they're just arriving directly to this shore, and so they're ending up going straight to Moria. Here's where the airport is, and this is where the port is also, where people are able to leave to go to Athens, which is up here. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you a little bit about the camps. Um, so this is a sign that one of the volunteers made. It says, welcome, and, um, and that's really the spirit of a lot of the volunteers, of all the volunteers, actually. Uh, maybe not the spirit of the Greek people, although some of them are uh, welcoming and sympathetic to the refugees, but, um, but, but generally a lot of these volunteers are really trying their best to make people feel special and welcome. Anyways, so this is the major camp, this is Moria. Um, I want to show you a few more pictures of Moria. This is Moria also. This is the campsite. So there's the campsite which we call the jungle. There's all these tents. And then there's the uh, compound side, which is here. These are uh, shacks provided by the UNHCR. Um, these are not heated. Uh, they're freezing cold. Um, they smell bad. And uh, this is where people, a lot of people sleep at night. Um, this is the campsite at uh, nighttime. Um, one of the volunteers, a few of the volunteers made a Christmas tree, and I thought that was a nice picture, so I took it. Again, I apologize for my pictures. I know they're not that good. Um, this is, again, the, comp uh, the compound side, so not where the tents are, but more where the detention facility is. And the reason I took this picture is because this is the power source for this washroom. This is, this is the washroom for these people, um, because they don't have toilets, right? Um, there's five squatters in each side for males and females. This is the wire that's providing power, and it's exposed here. It's also exposed up here. Um, I'm not saying that it's totally unsafe, because it didn't rain while I was there. But um, it's, and, and uh, there are volunteers that will be taking care of this, but I mean, this is not, these are not great conditions, obviously, to be living in, right? This is a little mom and uh, baby tent. And this is the Oxy Camp. Oxy Camp is named Oxy because Oxy is a nightclub where the parking lot <coughs> which uh, has been made into um, a transit camp. The, the UNHCR, again, has made two um, uh, big tents here. This is one of them. Oxy, tent, uh, Oxy Camp is actually quite beautiful. 
uh, in the sense of it's very clean and tidy. The volunteers there do a fantastic job. This is the bathroom. Um, the bathrooms in Moria are, the MSF recommendation for the number of latrines per person, uh, per, uh, uh, the number of people per latrine is 20. Uh, uh, Dr. Zadel Borders recommends that in refugee camps you should have one person for, uh, you should have 20 people per each latrine. We had about, I would say altogether there was 20 bathrooms there and on uh, the lowest day that we had people in Moria there was a thousand people there. So 20 divided by 1,000, uh, uh, 1,000 divided by 20 is 50 people, which is 2.5 times the amount of people that MSF recommends to have a safe latrine. Um, these are the conditions. This is Scala. Uh, this is another uh, uh, refugee camp. It's run by an organization called Lighthouse. I just like this. This is a bathroom made by two Swedish volunteers who are husband and wife. They came to Greece, they got all the lumber they needed, and they built outhouses. These outhouses are even better, in my opinion, than the ones provided by MSF at Moria. Um, okay, so it's quite ingenious. Moving on. Okay, this is registration. So what happens when they get to the camp? The whole point is these are transit camps. These people are trying to get to Athens. So basically, they need to register and somehow get some sort of status in Europe. So they get, oh my god. Okay, so they get um, registration papers in Moria, uh, where they're allowed to stay in Greece for 30 days. So now they have, to, they have 30 days to get out of Greece. And uh, so basically this is uh, a picture of the lineup. So this place, this line is almost always like this. Um, these are a bunch of uh, Afghani guys. There's two uh, lineups. There's one here for Syrians, and then this is for everyone else. So the Syrian people are fast-tracked, which is good because they're leaving a war zone. Um, and there's lots of women and children in the Syrian, uh, 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 amongst, amongst the Syrian refugees. But uh, I kind of feel bad for the other refugees because then they're not fast-tracked and uh, they're ending up, a lot of the times, they're ending up waiting in the transit camp, a camp that's not meant to be a, a camp, like a long-term thing. They're ending up waiting there for uh, days that are longer than what the camp, the infrastructure, limited infrastructure of the camp is ready to support. Anyways, this is a really nice volunteer. I like her. Most of the volunteers I found were UK, British, um, uh, Swedish, uh, some Germans, uh, some Canadians. I met a guy there from Ross Shep in Edmonton named Corey. And I was like, what? I'm like, I went to Trinity. And he was like, super cool. And we didn't take a picture together, even though we meant to. Um, and, uh, and, and so, and there's a lot of Americans there. I worked with a lot of Americans. Um, and, and in fact, one of the coolest things uh, I heard one of the refugees say in my language in Urdu, I was walking past him, it was late at night, there's no light, so I don't really know who said it, but I did hear him say in my language, um, in Goronki kya insaniyate. And what he basically was saying is, look at, this might sound crude, but this is what he said. He said, look at the humanity of these white people. Like, you know, what, like, I mean, they were there to help them, regardless of what is their government doing, but it was nice. Like, I mean, uh, it's true, you know, like, that's the spirit that we should try to aspire for as humans, is to help each other regardless of our skin color or ethnicity or whatever, who cares? You know, those are not important things. What's more important is uh, that we help each other, we try and make the world a better place, and, and we never trust the government because they'll never do anything right. And, uh, exactly. Okay, so, uh, exactly, even Trudeau. <laughs> Anyways, medic work, really quick. This better, better than the previous one. Yeah, yeah. yes, you're right. Mama. Positive change. Yeah, you're right, positive change. Um, I do want to point out a really uh, a couple of interesting things here. Um, they're not interesting um, in a good way, but they're uh, it's uh, something that you know, kind of uh, health issues that these people face. Okay, so this is our mash tent. Um, <laughs> Uh, pretty haphazard, bunch of volunteers, health point projects. This is the inside of it. This is our cot. Um, this is our supply table. And we made a little park for the kids. But what's important is this. She's six days old. She arrived at three in the morning. Uh, it was about plus zero. Um, she had a bunch of blankets on, but she was dry. She was pretty dehydrated. And she had a nappy rash that was basically like a first degree burn. Um, maybe even a second degree burn because she had uh, sca uh, her skin was peeling. Um, that also makes babies dehydrated, All right? Um, we got her mom to breastfeed her like crazy, um, but I mean this is a danger. 
not maybe that, like I mean, this is not the optimal situation for a seven-day-old to be in, right? Who knows where she was born? She was probably born in a camp in Turkey, right? So she was beautiful, and I and, and I love her, but um, but that's pretty tragic in my opinion. This guy had frostbite. This guy's an Iraqi man who carried his wife over the mountains in Sinjar. Then he went back and carried his sister, and his toes froze. Now he has frostbite. This is necrotic, which means this part of his toe is going to fall off. We told him to basically keep it clean and dry. They thought it was a bruise. He's like, but my foot really hurts. And everyone's like, look, he has a bruise on his foot. And we look at it, and I'm like, this is frostbite. This is not a bruise. And he could potentially lose both of his toes. It was super sad. This is the boy, again, I talked to you guys about him. I was going to touch back on it, but I thought the other moment was more opportune. His family, two family members, were killed by ISIS. <coughs> uh, his mother was a beautiful Kurdish woman, and she told us her story. Um, a, a lot of women from my mosque uh, put their money together and sent me about um, 2,500 Canadian dollars, which I split into 300 euros, and I distributed it to people. Um, and I'm not the only one that was doing this. Tons of volunteers were doing this. Like, everyone was getting money from back home. Uh, from their friends, from Facebook, crowdfunding, and um, uh, giving people just enough money to get them to the next point, because someone inevitably will help them at the next point. You have to depend on that. You can't give all your money to one family. So we gave this woman 300 euros, and she was super happy. And what a beautiful person she was. Um, anyways, this is a little bit, okay, this guy's Nathan. Um, he has been in Greece for a year. He's a paramedic. Uh, he goes back to the UK every couple we every couple months, works for a week, just puts piles the money away, and then comes back to Greece. Um, he's amazing. He's a pain in the UNHCR's uh, backside. Um, he's <laughs> constantly hounding them to do more, to get more blankets, to do, to stop being so annoying. Um, and uh, and and so Nathan goes to all the meetings and really puts a thorn in everyone's side, and he's doing a fantastic job there. Uh, these are some uh, British nurses. She's a midwife, she's an ER nurse. She's from France, her name's Amina, she's a Muslim. She's an Afghani nurse from New York City. Um, that's a little baby that we were looking after. Uh, that's basically, we were doing night rounds, <coughs> so identifying the vulnerable and the sick. Okay, just really quick, another picture. So this is relief work. This is an Afghani family, this girl had um, uh, developmental uh, issues with her hips. She had a really tough time walking, but she walked from Afghanistan through Iran into Turkey, where they took the bus. <sighs> and, um, and then she arrived in Greece, and she's beautiful. She's such a gorgeous, beautiful human being. I love her. It's her sister. We helped their family out, too. Um, these are some translators, Nofal and Mohammed. This guy's from Montreal. He's pain, but he's funny. Okay, this was um, relief work in the middle of the night. Uh, these are a bunch of Kurdish refugees burning their blankets for fuel. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I mean, that just shows you the refugee mentality, right? Uh, you're surrounded by barbed wire. Um, you have to use the blanket either to warm yourself on top or you burn it to, for fuel. I mean, what a tragedy. Uh, we ended up getting them a tent, um, and they did okay. This is Terry. He's a nurse from New York City. Um, but I mean, wow. This is our charging station made by Nofeldi. Uh, just, <coughs> let me see if I do, can I just show one video? Do I have time? For a video, maybe? Yeah, short video. Let's see. Um, okay, so this is a girl from the US who, this is in the food tent in the middle of the Shake it up, shake it up, oh, shake it up, shake it up, shake it up, look at the girl, shake it up. I can't tell you how happy she made people. This woman, like, my God. These refugees, it's freezing cold at night, okay? And it's dark as hell, there's no power outside. And these guys are standing around garbage cans and fires and them singing songs in their language. You can walk past Avani singing some Afghani folk songs, you can walk past Pakistani singing songs that like Shabazz Kalam, they're like songs that we've grown up our whole lives listening to. Um, and I found that the music really helped with their spirits and that was a really cool thing that um, we did end up seeing. This is, um, I, I don't have enough time to show the other videos, so, um, but basically, uh, that, that's all I wanted to tell you guys, is I just wanted to show you guys uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of um, 
what, what my experience was like there. And I think that everyone, it would be great if all of us could go because they really do need the volunteers there. And you don't have to have a particular skill. It doesn't even, most of the volunteers there are, are not medics. Most of the volunteers there don't speak another language. But um, they're really doing a fantastic job. And, and hopefully the stupid war uh, ends soon and, um, and people can get on with their lives. Okay, thanks for your attention.